Our next guest's work has appeared in or is forthcoming from Poetry, American Poetry Review, The Believer, Court Green, and Rattle, and she is the 2015 winner of the Neil Postman Award for Metaphor from Rattle Magazine. She lives in Chicago, where she has been an artist in residence at the Museum of Science and Industry and a Poetry Foundation Lily Rosenberg Fellow. Please give a warm welcome back to Hannah Gamble. that I would read poems, but then I really liked Scott's thing, and it reminded me of this short essay that I wrote um, that I would actually love to be able to read in front of people. It's going to be on you know, the internet at some point, but I want to say it out loud to you all now. And then I think uh, there will probably be enough time for me to read maybe like a long poem. After that. Cool. Okay. Um, so this essay is called On the White Men Who Don't Want Revolution. <laughs> when I was about 15, a woman in my church told several members of the congregation that there was another member of the church who was a witch. I remember being excited by this news because it meant that my friends took it upon themselves to skip the day's main assembly and go to a smaller chapel next door and anoint each of the pews with holy oil and pray that the witch woman and the demon inside her would be cast out. Of course, I would join them and would thus be doing something besides sitting and listening. Uh, to a sermon. I don't know how many of you guys went to church, but they're old. In my case, it was an old southern man who everyone was really bored by, but he was like a sweet old grandpa guy. So everyone's just like, all right, you know, but <laughs> I, was, I was always looking for any excuse to not be there. My father found out that I had skipped the service, so we had a conversation that night where I tried to convince him that I had made a wise and Christianly decision, that I had been doing something more important than listening to a boring sermon. So-and-so says that judgment is coming to our congregation, I said, repeating something that my friends had told me. Hannah, my father said, you don't want judgment to come to our church. Judgment would be bad for all of us. It's a scary and bad thing. But if God thinks judgment needs to happen, shouldn't we just let it happen, I said. No, was the gist of what my father concluded. <laughs> I think about this exchange every time a white poet criticizes the way that poets of color call out the racism that they've experienced in the academic and literary worlds. The arguments against these kinds of openly angry displays is usually like they're doing it wrong and they're going to alienate every white person who could be a valuable ally by being too angry, seeming too volatile, and being unprofessional. It's hard for me to believe that these critical white people are really ultimately concerned for the poets of color, that they might not be getting ultimate, uh, optimal results. I usually think instead that these criticisms are coming from deep inside the white person who doesn't want themselves and their loved ones one day to be unfairly targeted. Let me say right now that I have been guilty of this very thing. A better title for this article might be On the People Who Don't Want Revolution Because They Haven't Been Killed or Raped or Beaten Yet. Women, for example, criticize other women for being too overtly angry or confrontational with feminist projects. The underlying message seems to be, some of us have worked very hard to get an okay thing going here, working and living within a system that hates us. Please don't ruin this for us. 
When I was teaching beginning writing and rhetoric at Prairie State College a few years ago, I had my students read Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. It's one of the best things ever written. If you've never read it before, you can read it here, and then I provide a link because this is going to be online, you know. <laughs> but you can just find a PDF of the whole thing online very easily, and it's just amazing, 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 and it's very easy to work into like a rhetoric and composition class because it's so masterfully rhetoric, well, it's so masterfully written you can like teach about ethos, pathos, and the other one? Logos. Yeah, that one. You can teach about all the ones. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, one of the most important ideas in this piece is that the biggest enemy to the black person's struggle for freedom and equality is the white moderate. The one who says, I'm your friend and ally, but I think you just need to wait. The timing isn't right. You're doing it wrong. If you would listen to me and follow my advice, you'd be able to get what you want. So don't be foolish and don't be hasty. I'm going to help you, just not right at this minute. I'm writing this a couple days after about 50 mostly queer Latinx people were killed at Pulse nightclub in Orlando. 53 more were wounded. There are people with whom I attended church in my teens who are posting things on their Facebook walls reminding everyone that mu Muslims are bloodthirsty killers. Then there are poets with whom I'm Facebook friends expressing their grief and reminding everyone I know that they are both Muslim and queer. Most of my Facebook feed, I'm very thankful, is full of messages of love and support for all of our queer Muslim Latinx siblings. I guess I should say, yeah, well, I'm not talking about the same person, queer, Muslim, Latinx, all the different people. Sorry, just doing some spot editing here. <laughs> okay. I'm thankful that these are the sentiments of most of the people that I know. I'm physically overcome with sadness that this is our world now, and really has been our world since the beginning of time. I just haven't fully known about it until a few years ago when the internet allowed me to read the stories of everyone, everyone who's brave enough to write about it and share it, everyone's suffering, and my head was finally out of my white grad school educated with mostly other white people ass. <laughs> Revolution is uncomfortable and violent and chaotic, and innocent people get hurt on the way to changing things so that fewer innocent people ultimately suffer. I'm a white, middle-class, educated, able-bodied, by common standards, attractive American who dates mostly people of the opposite gender. And I also love many people who fit this criteria. But I still want the revolution to come. If I or the people I love get hurt, I will grieve it and wish that it had been otherwise. But everyone else is already being hurt, killed, Un jailed unfairly, abused by police, told they're bringing this violence upon themselves by not revolting correctly, or let alone revolting by not putting their hands up correctly, not dressing correctly, by not resisting arrest correctly, by not peacefully protesting correctly. So if I or the ones I love get hurt or even killed, so be it. I don't want that to happen but so be it. My favorite Talking Heads song is the one where everyone is dead and the earth is covered in flowers. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, so, I'll read this poem. <laughs> I just wanted to switch arms because this MacBook Air weighs a whole like 1.5 pounds or something. So. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read this sort of longer poem in sections that uh, is also kind of more like an essay than a poem, and that's just the direction I'm headed in these days. I've been thinking a lot about how I actually get really pissed off 
with poetry that is impossible to understand because if someone gives you a microphone and you don't speak into that microphone like the things that you think about most and care about most or maybe you think you are writing about those things but you have like protected yourself with like obscure wording so that no one can really like criticize you um, and so consequently no one really knows what you're talking about. I just think that's garbage. <laughs> I really like this series because a lot... Oh, you're still here! Yeah, I thought you had to go! I got I'm that email! Later. Later. Oh, later! So. Okay, cool. Oh, well, oh, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Hi, Scott. <laughs> um, but you know, I like stuff like when people read essays, and I don't see that at a lot of other reading series, I describe other reading series as more like straight up literary and academic, but I'm not really saying that in a nice way. I'm saying like those people have the luxury of not communicating what they care about most, and they have the luxury of protecting like the ish like their feelings on what's most important and vulnerable to them. Um, so anyway, I've been having a hard time writing poems because I just kind of want to like straight up talk to people about things, but all the awards I've won are in poetry, so that's like my in, so I'll probably just keep writing things that are actually essays and calling them poems, and try to be listened to uh, in places. Okay, so here's uh, this poem. It's called Men and Women in Movies. The difference between the violence to men and women in movies is that the man is smashed over the head with a toilet lid and the woman is mutilated after the villain cuts off her clothes one button at a time. I hate that people who make movies are like, garner ye boners where ye may, <laughs> or make lemons, murder, into lemonade, boners, <laughs> uh, via sexualized torture and even movies that purport to be feminist because they have a strong female lead which probably just means that the female lead has a mohawk or is not immediately friendly to the male lead <laughs> do this because not every actor not every director not every camera guy not every producer is a feminist and so if a strong female lead gets raped in a movie, then someone along the Oregon Trail that is the movie set to post-production, to movie poster, to movie trailer, is gonna try and make it just a little bit sexy, even if only registrable in the deep spongy tissue of the one closer to the body ball or at the backmost ceiling of the vaginal atrium. <laughs> When the hooker shakily and stiffly grabs the back of the man who's strangling her. In our teens, my friends and I wondered if we had been raped in past lives, considering our aversion to men, our disgust at the thought of sex, our fear of being touched by anyone who wanted us, and how safe we felt around anyone who didn't want us. All those things seemed to be the psychic elements of girls who had been entered by force and finished in by force. I was raised in an evangelical fundamentalist Christian town in Middle Tennessee. Once a boy took me to our church's gift shop and asked which cross necklace he should buy me for my 12th birthday. My Sunday school teacher saw us, me smiling and following the boy around. The teacher brought me into his office to scold me for flirting. He said that I didn't know what I was encouraging the boy to do, but that he knew because he was a man and he knew what men thought about and were capable of. Despite the fact that I was afraid of sex, I sometimes fantasized about being cornered in a bathroom and forced to. To want to have sex is wrong and makes you a gross person but to be taken when as far as is observable you don't want it and didn't ask for it is blameless, I thought. 
If you go to college, you'll learn about the collective unconscious, and that really changes things. If you go to college, you'll finally learn which men will leave you alone if you sit on their laps, but then say no, and which men won't count the no if you've already sat on their laps, and which friends will ask for sexy pictures if you behaviorally lower the drawbridge, but will stop asking when you say they should stop asking, and which friends will have to stop being friends because they won't stop asking. There was a famous poet who later in life wouldn't let any man into her apartment. Luckily, she liked having sex with women. I had sex with two women and learned that I was straighter than most of the erotic dreams of my teen years seemed to have indicated. <laughs> But a former military leader slash energy healer slash astrologer in India told his son over the phone, uh, who was my only friend to ever to, uh, ever to offer to ruin the life of one of my exes. Uh, the astrologer encouraged the son to tell me that my birth chart indicated that in my 60s I would be so tired of dealing with men that I would romance only women. I read an earlier version of this poem at a music festival, and the man I was with asked me if I thought it was true that one day I would love only women. I started thinking out loud. I made a speculative list of all the reasons I might be done with men one day. Oh, never mind, he said. We don't have to talk about this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so. left the stage yet because I wanted to tell you that I have books of poems over here and if you wanted to buy one for me I'd love to write you a nice note and just kind of it's a nice way to talk and say hi um, so don't be shy and thank you guys for an experience that I always love and adore and okay thanks bye <laughs>